If you joined us through the time we did not meet in church, uh, you might remember a sermon series called Fundamentals. Anyone remember that one? Uh, I, I shared those sermons by rivers and lakes and different spots, and we took the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh Avenue Church, and we studied the first seven of them. Uh, we're continuing that series now. The plan is to continue it for four years because seven times four is 28, so we'll get seven uh, fundamental beliefs each year throughout this series because it's important that we pause and reflect on basic fundamental teachings of Scripture. We don't have to get very fancy. We just need to know the basic things God has revealed to us. So we are going to be there the next seven weeks going through fundamentals. Uh, if you want to keep track of the series or uh, see more about the fundamentals, uh, I've taken some time to to organize that real well on the website. Actually, the PastorRyanRogers.com website, the banner just says fundamentals on top. It has all the messages from before. It has the wording of our fundamental beliefs, um, and it has blogs and, and every, all the um, references that I might be using in the sermons. They're all right there, PastorRyanRogers.com. So our church does have 28 statements, very carefully thought out statements of belief, and probably the most important wording in those statements is the preamble because it sets the stage for how we articulate our beliefs. The preamble of our seventh day, of our 28th fundamental beliefs, I have a little baptismal certificate here, says this, and I am so grateful to belong to a church that can say something like this. It says the seventh day Adventist, or seventh day Adventist accept the Bible as their only creed. Isn't that a great way to start? And hold to certain fundamental beliefs to be the teachings of the Holy Scriptures. These beliefs are set forth here, constitute the church's understanding and expression of the teaching of Scripture. Revision of these statements may be expected at a general conference session when the church has is led by the Holy Spirit to a fuller understanding of biblical truth or finds better language in which to express the teachings of of God's holy word. I love that statement. It says two things strongly. It says, one, we don't know it all. God is so much bigger than I or any church can express in words. But it also says we think it's valuable to take the pieces we know and be diligent to study them and articulate them and write them out so that we can have the clearest understanding of what God has revealed to us. Aren't those, those two wonderful things? We don't know it all, but let's be careful to be students of what we can know. Aren't you glad to belong to a church that has that perspective? Augustine, in his uh, work on the Holy Spirit, wrote, wrote this long deep theological work. And then at the end of it, he said, let us not pretend that after we are done describing God, that we have defined him. Isn't that a great statement? After we, after we have finished our best description of who God is, that is not a definition of God. So as we go through these fundamentals the next seven weeks. We are describing God to the best of our human language as the Holy Spirit opens up truth to us. We are not defining God. We are not putting him in a little box and saying these statements are the edges of who God is. We're just describing an awesome God and it is so powerful to let our lives be guided by the truths that we can know. So we are beginning with fundamental belief. It's actually wrong on the screen. Number eight, not number nine, and it's called The Great Controversy. Uh, if you would like some good resources on this, I'll recommend some. Uh, one is a book called The Great Controversy, and it is not uh, tied necessarily to this doctrine. The doctrine stands alone. It's not based on a book. But the book, The Great Controversy, is a historical and prophetic overview of this theme of the Great Controversy. And we've had some people set up some resources out here. Did you see the literature when you came in? Um, so great stuff to grab, and that book is out there. Another one I came across just last week is, is the website is 
loveandwarstory.com. You should check it out. So it's a uh, dramatic, just one guy t- telling, but um, artistic telling of the story of the great controversy in 10 episodes, but without like just reading text and looking at a screen. He's telling the story. Uh, it's powerful. And then if you were with, with us last year as we went through a seven-part series called The Story of Love, another resource uh, that describes the story of the great controversy. So we're going to pause and pray before we study the doctrine. Father in heaven, pray you would speak truth to us today. Open our hearts to see this, this teaching that really frames our entire experience. And I pray the truth would transform our hearts. Guide us and give us hope and uh, correct our perspective with the truth you've re- revealed in Scripture. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's an article I read entitled, This is the way it was. And the article opening line said, it was a lovely day for strolling along the seashore. The article was written by Ernie Pyle. And it might have been a lovely day, but the stroll he took was not a lovely stroll because he was riding from Normandy Beachhead after D-Day. And he continued to describe what he saw there with words like this. The wreckage was vast and startling. The awful waste and destruction of war. Ernie Pyle was a war correspondent from the beginning of World War II until he was killed by gunfire on April 17, 1945. So the job of a war correspondent is to be present in the battle, not to fight the battle, but to tell the story. So he would go with the troops so that he could bring the story back to the people. That is a crazy job to want to have. I'm going to step into this battle so I can tell the story of what happened. But few people, like Ernie Pyle, accepted the job because it is an incredibly important role. Their job is to help make sense of the chaos of war. So all this destruction and death that we hear about, they take the pieces they can figure out, the who, what, when, where, and why of war, and put a story together so that there is some meaning to it for the folks back home. So in a very real way, believers in God who have some glimpse into his character and are living in the heat of battle, are in the position of a war correspondent. We are living in the battle, but we have glimpses of the who, what, when, where, and why. And as we put that together, we can give meaning to the chaos of the spiritual war that we're in. And that's what the great controversy does. And it's so needed because if we don't have some way to put the story together, all of it just looks meaningless, like a big waste of war and destruction. But the great controversy, or the, doc, the teaching in our fundamental beliefs that we describe as the great controversy, this spiritual war that we live in, has meaning. And we're going to look at that from the perspective of a war correspondent. So we're going to ask the five W's. Who, what, Where, when, and why. And we're going to ask them of the great controversy. You can open up to Revelation 12, and it describes some of these things. It gives meaning to the chaos behind the destruction we're living in. I'm so grateful for the way that we've been able to understand truths from Scripture because our world is hurting and feeling hopeless And when God reveals something about who he is and what we're experiencing, we have some way to make sense of it, frame it. So we're going to look at Revelation 12, the who of the great controversy. And we see that the who of the great controversy is all of us. Starting in verse 7, we see 
some characters highlighted at the center of it. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon and his. So right away we have some people identified, some figures identified who are the who of the great controversy. The dragon is quickly identified as Satan in, in verse 9. Michael is not clearly identified there. Um, Adventists traditionally have understood Michael to be a pre-incarnate name for Christ. <coughs> so there's, there's some resistance to that in the Christian community. Maybe you've heard people not like that idea of identifying Michael as Christ. And part of that has to do with the fact that the Jehovah's Witness also have that interpretation And their conclusion to that study is Christ is not divine. Because Michael is an archangel, Christ is a created being, he's just a chief among created beings. So that's not where we go with that argument. If you identify Michael as Christ or you don't, the Seventh-day Adventist Church clearly does not teach that Christ is a created being. If you go back to uh, fundamental belief number four about the Son, we believe that he is fully divine, and yet became fully human. So that's not where we go, but the good news is you do not have to identify Michael as Christ to understand the great controversy because Christ is brought into the center of the controversy down in verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brethren have been thrown down. And then in verse 11 we see that it is the blood of the Lamb that overcomes this adversary. So I think there is good biblical argument for identifying Michael as a pre-incarnate name for Christ. But if that stump makes you stumble, don't worry. It's clear from Revelation 12 that center, central figures in this war are Christ and Satan. There is a theme of war of good and evil in our whole, our whole world, every movie, every book, Uh, The Bible just gives them names. Good is Christ. Evil is Satan. And they are central figures in this war. And it's not just them. They had angels. Revelation 12 earlier says that the dragon swept away a third of the angels. You know that's good news because that means there are more with us than are with them. A third is less than half, right? So when you're feeling oppressed spiritually, there are more for you than there are against you. And even if there weren't angels, God is more than any, any created forces could ever bring against you. But there are evil angels. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God. And before it describes the armor, it says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So the who of the great controversy includes every single angel either warring against us in a spiritual way or supporting us in the battle. That should speak a lot to us when we think about who we're fighting against. When we degrade into thinking of us versus them with humans, we have identified the wrong enemy. When it's me versus someone I don't like, I am fighting against another victim of the great controversy when really the enemy is the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And it would just be great if we wasted, in Satan's eyes, if we wasted all our energy fighting against another person and took no energy in putting on the armor of God because our enemy is a spiritual enemy. And it continues, not just Christ and Satan and Uh, Christ's angels and Satan's angels, but every one of us. So you'll notice as I just skim through the text, you'll you'll notice a narrowing focus of the dragon. In verse 7, his sights are set on all of heaven. Like, he's raging war because he wants to be the supreme ruler of the universe. Well, he's defeated and he's cast down. When he's cast down, he makes war on the whole world. So it's all of us. It's the whole world. Well, then we get to verse 11, and we see that Christ's blood defeats him, so he can't conquer the whole world. So he has great rage in verse 12, and then verse 13 and on, he focuses his sights on a specific group, the the woman, 
or the church. And he's successful in some ways, but it describes in Revelation 12 that the earth protected the woman. So once again, he could not have full control there. So he sets his sights even more specifically on the offspring of the woman. In verse 17, he is warring against those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So although the who of the great controversy includes everyone, in a very special way, it, ke- it includes those who specifically Love Jesus. So our war correspondent, with his boots on the ground, in the heat of the battle, reports the story and he breaks the news. Now this war, it includes every single one of us. There's no one exempt from this war. So we'll ask the question, what? What is this war about? Who is an all-inclusive, all of us? What is this war about? And I think this might be the most important point to get clear. We are not going in battle because we heard about weapons of mass destruction or because we have a border issue. The, the central what of the great controversy is rejection of God. We could get more specific, but that is the central what. Our fundamental beliefs describe it this way. They say it is a conflict regarding the character of God, so I can reject his character, His law, I could reject his law. His sovereignty over the universe, I could reject that. So the central what of this great controversy is, are you going to reject God or are you going to love God? And we see that in God's sovereignty in the text. By sovereignty, we mean letting God be who he is, supreme ruler of the universe. No one else wants that job. We're not made for it. We are not God. So God is sovereign, but there's a rejection of that that happened in heaven. Uh, We see that when it says in verse 8 that the dragon was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. So the dragon and his angels had no place in heaven. Well, actually, they did have a place in heaven. They just rejected that place. I went back and read Ezekiel 28, this picture we get that refers, we we see Lucifer illustrated in this picture in Ezekiel 28. And I read for the first time last week a line I never saw before. God literally says, I placed you. So we see there's no place for them in heaven. And then we see in Ezekiel 28 that Lucifer in his high exalted state in heaven, God says of him, I specifically, personally placed you. I gave you a place. And his place was high and exalted. He was the model of perfection and perfect in beauty. So he had a high position. Every single fallen angel had a God-given place in heaven. You know what went wrong? They rejected that place because that place was appropriately under the sovereignty of God. Every one of us have a place, and it is under God's sovereignty. But we know the story of Lucifer. He got this, uh, this desire to ascend, persistently wanting to be higher and higher until we hear that he wanted to be like the Most High. And so there was a place for Lucifer, and there was a place for all the angels, but they didn't accept that place because that place required God to be sovereign. So at the core of the great controversy is a rejection of God, specifically a rejection of God's sovereignty. I'm not going to let God be supreme in my life. And that's how the war rages on right now. The battle is, today will you let God be sovereign in your life? Or do you think maybe you'd be a better God than him? That's the great controversy right there. It's also rejection of God's truth. But we see that in verse 9. For the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. So when he's thrown down, he's thrown down as a deceiver. So maybe not weapons of mass destruction, but of mass deception. That is his tool. His main tool is he came to this earth, Genesis 3, and brought sin to this earth through lies. So God has this perfect, beautiful character. And we have a spiritual enemy that at the the core of the great controversy, he's individually giving messages to us that says, there's something more beautiful. There's something more satisfying. God can't really be trusted. 
Because at the core is a rejection of God's truth. That He is who He says He is. That He is the most satisfying thing. And the great controversy operates on lies to get us to reject God's truth. We also see this a rejection of God's grace. In verse 10, we see, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. He's the accuser, and then it says he accuses them before God. So one of the enemy's tactics is accusation. In fact, the word Satan means the accuser. And he's accusing us so that we live in guilt and shame, and we reject God's grace. And we do this in two big ways. One of the ways we might reject God's grace is doing it on our own. I'm good enough to earn my way for God to love me. That's a rejection of God's grace. Or the other might, might go the opposite direction and say, I'm so bad, he would never love me. Well, that's a rejection of God's grace. Whichever, you, if you decide you're good enough or you're so bad, it is, either way, is rejecting the grace of God that I cannot make it on my own, but I'm not so bad that God's grace cannot redeem me. Because his grace is huge. So at the core of the great controversy is a rejection of God. And one of the ways we see that is if Satan can get, can get us to reject God's grace, he won that battle. Rejection of God. So we fight the battle by preferring God. By choosing God. By trusting God. That is, every single temptation that comes our way is an opportunity for you to say, I trust that what God has is better for me than this thing I'm craving. I trust God enough to know that His ways are actually ultimately more satisfying. And I was just thinking about this phrase as I was preparing the sermon, I prefer God. Isn't that a powerful phrase? Just say it. Just say it. I prefer God. Anytime you're in a situation where you have a desire for something that is not of God, pause and, and, and go to the core of who you are and, and tell yourself, no, I actually prefer God. I prefer God over this thing. Because at the core of the great controversy, a very simple thing. Do you prefer God and trust God and desire God and want God and know that He is who He says He is? Or are you going to reject Him for a preference for something else? That's at the core of what the great controversy is. Satan has chosen to reject him. Third of the angels have chosen to reject him. And now the focus is, can I get these humans to prefer God, trust God, or just reject him? That's the what at the center of the great controversy. So who, what, and when? Well, when is, is uh, seen partially in Revelation 12. We see that when the gate controversy happens is right now, but it's also from the very first sin to the final judgment. So it spans our entire experience because it began in heaven, and we don't know exactly in earth's history when this heavenly thing happened, but we know it happened before Genesis 3 because in Genesis 3, the serpent shows up on earth deceiving as it describes in verse 8 and 9. So we know it happened before then, which means every human being ever born which is everyone but Adam and Eve. So every human being ever born has been born into the controversy. So we have, we know, we know when it happens. It happens before you and I were born, the entire experience, and then it's concluded, not even at the second coming. That's just when he pulls the troops home. But it's concluded after we've had a thousand years to contemplate the controversy, and God gives final end to all evil. So it will end. The war is long, but it's coming to an end. So if you're the war correspondent observing this chaos we live in, this suffering we live in, you can break the news that this controversy happens right now. It's in the moment, and it spans all of history. And when we ask the question where, we get a similar answer. It is both on the large scale and the small scale, because where this controversy happens is everywhere and also very specifically right here. 
It's everywhere. It began in heaven. Verse 7. There's no combat in heaven anymore because the angels and Satan, they were cast down, but they're involved, and now it is on this earth, and it's raging through the whole earth. So where is this great controversy? Well, it fills the global headlines. It's in Afghanistan. It's in China. It's in America. It's in the human trafficking operation. It's in the abusive home. And it's in the things that are a result of sin, like a decaying earth and natural disasters that wipe out towns and cities. It's in the, the phone call that someone has passed away. It's in the bedroom of the loved one taking their last breath. It's in depression. We see the controversy all around us. It's all we have ever known. This is where it is. We're living in a war zone. And it's either an act of sin or a result of sin. That's all we see. So where is this great controversy? It's in the global headlines, but it's also in the local ones. And we can't overlook that it's right here. We can't just say it's out there because it is right here at the most intimate place it could be. It's right in my mind. The great controversy is in every single thought that either, as the Bible tells us, exalts itself above God or is kept captive to Christ. So at the very smallest intimate level, it is an intentional war zone. There's no like place I can escape and say, oh, well, the battle's out there, but I'm, I'm good here. It is everywhere, and it's right here. That's where it is. And why? Why the great controversy? That's the big question, because uh, we have lots of unanswered questions when we look at suffering and pain. I'm tired of it, aren't you? I've had people I know pass away this past week. I see people struggling in all kinds of horrific ways. I am sick of this controversy. And so we ask these questions of God, and and here's the key. If you understand the great controversy, is that the great controversy raises some serious questions To which the great controversy is the only satisfying answer. Do you follow me? Great controversy raises some serious questions to which the great controversy is the only satisfying answer. So all the results of sin we see raise some terrifying uh, questions and emotions, but the only satisfying answer is actually understanding why the great controversy exists. At the heart of the great controversy, the why of it all, It's love. So God gave us freedom because love doesn't exist without freedom. And freedom comes with a risk. And the risk is that we'll reject Him. And that is the the what of the great controversy. We reject God. And when we reject Him, well then sin has its results. So we are living in the results of rejection of God. But why was rejection of God ever given? Because God valued love so much that he gave us freedom. And I was stopped in uh, Sabbath school this morning and heard this talk about love, and I had to listen. Like, God is the definition of love. But, but pause and think. This is such a, a powerful, hopeful thought. That every bit of pain and suffering you experience, every bit of the great controversy, God knows it, and in his infinite wisdom, he thinks it's worth it for the reward of an eternity of love. Now, I might not think it's worth it, but you know why? It's because my estimation of eternal love is pretty small. My estimation of how good an eternity of free, voluntary love to God and love from God is is small, but he knows that that thing that he promises in eternity that we preach about and sing about is so good that it's worth risking every bit of pain we've ever experienced. Now that is a huge love. If it's worth every bit of suffering and pain, because God could have just said, let's not give them the, the, the freedom and let's not take the, take the risk and let's have a very agreeable situation in heaven for all of eternity. He said, no, 
the love I am after is so good that it's justifiable to risk every bit of pain we are experiencing. That is a good eternity. That's better than I can describe. It's a good God. And so the war correspondent with boots on the ground in the heat of the battle breaks the news that the reason behind all of this is an uncompromising, undying love of God. So Ernie Pyle, that war correspondent, had experiences like you and I that took their toll. Uh, He began to show signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. And at his time, in the end of his time in Europe, he was so weak from seeing all that he had seen. And he wrote in one article, he said, My spirit is wobbly and my mind is confused. He said, All of a sudden, it seemed to me that if I heard one more shot or saw one more dead man, I would go off my nut. And that's us. Some of us are holding it together today, but, but that's really us. War correspondents worn thin by the great controversy. We have wobbly spirits and confused minds. And it's okay to admit that. We are beat up. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of this pain. I'm sick of this ungodliness. And we are worn thin by the great controversy. And if we see one more thing, it could just just about cause us to, like he says, go off our nut. But here's the thing. Remember the five W's. The who, what, when, where, and why. Who, who, what, when, and where of the great controversy. They describe the reality we're in. But the why will give us the endurance to finish. Because the who, what, when, where, they describe that it is, you know, it's bad. It's everyone. And, and it's rejection of God that is at the core of it. And it's in all places and it's specifically right here. So this is a very deadly, bad, inclusive war. But the fifth W, the why, the fact that it's all because of love, that will give us endurance to finish the fight. First four, describe the reality. The final W is what we can hold on to. And we can be like those. Revelation 12, verse 11. Who conquer him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they have not loved their lives unto death. Oh, those words drive the enemy crazy because... The rejection of God is at the core and there's somebody who conquers by the blood of the Lamb and doesn't love their life unto death. That means they preferred God over everything this life could offer. Or we could be like those described in Revelation 13, who the dragon, or in Revelation 12, 17, who the dragon is furious with, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So if you're worn thin, by the great controversy. Trust that all of this is only happening because we have an uncompromising God of love. I'm going to read the words in closing, uh, the way that our church has articulated this belief. Fundamental belief number eight, and then we're going to sing a song and close. And I hope that this can help place you in the battle and give some meaning to the chaos we see. We believe as a church that all humanity is now involved in a great controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God, his law, and his sovereignty over the universe. This conflict originated in heaven when a created being endowed with freedom of choice in self-exaltation became Satan, God's adversary, and led into rebellion a portion of the angels. He introduced the spirit of rebellion into this world when he led Adam and Eve into sin. This human sin resulted in the distortion of the image of God in humanity, the disorder of the created world, and its eventual devastation at the time of the flood. It presents in histor- the historical account of Genesis 1 through 11. Observed by the whole creation, this world became the arena of universal conflict out of which the God of love will ultimately be vindicated. To assist his people in this controversy, Christ sends the Holy Spirit 
and the loyal angels to guide and protect and sustain them in the way of salvation.